Hello and welcome to Technically Speaking, a podcast where scientists and engineers come together to chat about common interests, share knowledge and satisfy some curiosity. I'm Antonia and in this episode I'm joined by Laura and Moeda along with our special guest Alec who founded the Embracing Diversity Diversity Diaries podcast to talk about bridges and why we love them so much. To start off with Laura, what's your interest in this? Well, I have a, a bit of a weird fascination with Victorian viaducts because they seem so graceful and strong and they're over 100 years old and some of them are still in use. And a really good example, I've not had the opportunity to visit it myself, but I've seen it in the movies. It's the Glenfinian Viaduct uh, in Scotland. It was opened in 1901 for the West Highland Railway and it's in the Harry Potter movies. It's that really long curving bridge that the train goes across. Oh, that's a nice one. Yeah, they're just so interesting to me. And they're always in green places as well. And I quite like greenery. So it's the, the greenness, the peacefulness and the grace and the strength of them. Yeah, definitely. They look really nice from afar. So Raider, you're also a bit obsessed with bridges and you're a structural engineer. So why do these viaducts last so long? Yes, of course, I'm obsessed with bridges. I would say a, a fact that not everybody knows about the viaduct the viaduct, you can consider them of a, like a series of many bridges. So each arch, it's its own bridge, then another bridge, 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 bridge to the end. And that one, one bit that is contribute to is resilient because it's like a designer's loss of bridges. And the other bit is the material use. So the viaducts are mainly considered as masonry bridges made of bricks and that the material have put in into the building has a high resistance and that's why it's staying for long, which would link us to another bridge I love to talk about. It's the very first documented bridge and it is in Mesopotamia. Uh, well, today Iraq, where, um, and it is in south of Iraq in the city of Tello. It's made of uh, clay bricks and it's still there, but it's like, it's not standing, it's fallen down, but it's fallen down as a whole and it's with its full shape and being noticeable. How old did you say that bridge was when it was, well, when was it constructed? How long ago? Third millennium BC, I think it was constructed. Ah. So it's like a long, long time ago. Wow, that is old. Cool. So, Alex, your bridge engineer, what do you like about bridges? I absolutely love bridges. Oh, there's so many reasons I love them. Firstly, I like what they kind of symbolize. It's like communication and connection or even travel and union. I love how diverse they can be. So there's so many different designs and materials. But my favourite type of bridge is one that's really iconic to a certain place. So as soon as you see that kind of bridge or a photo of it, you know exactly where it is in the world. And it really kind of makes that city or place stand out. So one of my favourites is the Tyne Bridge because I used to live in Newcastle. And something I really like about this bridge is the fact that Dorothy Buchanan helped to design it. And she was the first female member of the Institution of Civil Engineers when that bridge opened in 1928. Wow, I grew up in the northeast, so yeah, I'm very familiar with the Tyne Bridge, but I didn't know that a female engineer helped with the construction. So that's pretty cool. Yeah, I really like that fact. Great. So if we dive in a bit more, actually, about the structure of bridges, Raiders mentioned rather old bridge, unfortunately not standing, but first documented bridge, and Alex has mentioned the Tyne Bridge, which is a bit more modern. Interestingly, it's a bit of a different construction to the Mesopotamia Bridge and the viaducts. Can you explain a bit more about that, Raider? As a structural engineer, whenever I look at a bridge, my brain convert that bridge to a system on forces, and then I'll try to figure out how the forces are converted. So for the Tyne Bridge, is called two-pin pass bridge. Uh, it's similar to the bridge in Sydney Harbour in Australia and the bridge uh, in Hellgate uh, in New York. And they're all like the shape of that is called a structural engineer two-pin truss. It's a what? What's a two-pin truss? So basically, if you look at the structure of it, you could see a collection of members that came together uh, as triangles. And that is a simple definition of a truss. So a truss is a collection of members that came to form a triangle and the triangle will carry the load. And the two pins, if we go back to the viaduct, and as I said, 
each arch is its own bridge. So it's each arch is two pins. So pins are the two points that hold the bridge together. So the first pin is one edge and the other pin is on the second edge of the bridge. So that is a, a two pin bridge and the arch is the shape of the bridge. Okay. So in the case of the Tyne Bridge, you've got those like two sort of towers either end. Are they the pins in that case? Yes. I get it. And when you say members, just so I, I feel like a complete idiot now, they're like the, the girders and things that the Tyne Bridge is made of. The girder is the, well, the platform. Then you'll have the small cable that would carry the load from that platform to the truss-shaped arch. And if you think about the truss-shaped arch is how the forces are integrated into that structure. So for a truss, it's only carry the load in compression tension. If you think of your pushing your hand together, that's a compression member. So it will transfer that load by compressing it. And if you think about the tension, if you think of your hand, then try to pull your hand the other way, pull them apart. And that is the tension force. So you could feel the forces with your hand. So that's basically how the truss will transfer forces in between its tiny tri uh, triangular members. So when you say the member, is it, I'm also picturing, you know, you know, when you sit down, you have a lap. And when you stand up, where does the lap go? Is a member actually a physical thing? Or is it just where the forces occur? So what I would refer as a member is the physical thing that would carry the load. So in the case of where, where we were pushing our hands together, our hands are the member. Yes, you're thinking of your hands as two members. And then the connection point is like the pinpoint for the triangle is the point in between your hands. So you're pushing together and the whole hand will carry the load from that point up to your arm. Speaking of the time bridge, I remember in 2012 hearing about a lightning bolt had struck the bridge. Wow, I bet the pictures are really nice of that. Yes. As long as everyone was safe as well. Yeah, nobody got hurt, but I wonder the effects it had on the bridge itself. Yeah, I mean, it's mostly um, metal, isn't it? So it must have conducted fairly well. And I guess the question is, what happens when you get to those? Are they they're masonry pins? I'm remembering the bridge correctly. I just hope that there were no one on the bridge by the time it was hit by the lighting because like steel transfer electricity and that's what we will be afraid of if, if, a, if a lighting hit a bridge with someone moving on it. Because if you're in a car, technically speaking, you'll have the tires to protect you. Apparently, that's not actually true. No. It's the fact that the frame that makes the car forms a Faraday cage. Ah. So it conducts all the electricity away from you. I didn't know that. Nothing to do with the tyres, given that all the voltage that's coming through the lightning. The voltage will arc across that gap that the tyres form really easily, apparently. Ah. So it, it's the fact you're in a big steel cage. That's what keeps you safe. Oh, okay. So I wonder if there's an element of that in the Tyne Bridge as well. I suspect not, but I don't know. I don't know about Faraday cages. Yeah, I, I can't imagine the Tyne Bridge was designed with lightning strikes in mind. I don't think so. I think it was designed in 1920-something. 1928, it was opened. Yes. Yeah, we need to do a bit of a cross digging into when Faraday was doing his stuff, I guess. But that's kind of getting off topic. <laughs> Yeah, I'm just thinking, how much do we plan disasters into our bridge building? The main two things on the top of my head when you ask that are the wind load and the earthquake, because they both cause dynamic load to your bridge, which might cause it to collapse if the frequency of the wind matches the frequency of the bridge. That would lead to a reason us case, which you don't want to happen. So we do design the bridges for some some sort of dynamic loading to protect it from disaster. Has everyone here seen the video of the Tacoma Narrows Bridge in Washington? I don't think so. Please could you explain what, what's it about? It's similar to um, Rueda, what she was explaining. Was it in about 1950s, 1960s, Rueda? Was it around then? Yes, around then, yeah. Yeah, I think the video is in black and white. Basically, the wind frequency matches the bridge frequency and it just keeps oscillating and oscillating until it collapses. We should totally share the link for that video in the bio because it's equally interesting and terrifying at the same time. Yeah, some pretty uh, cool physics going on, maybe. Yeah. Um, I don't know if they are cool if you're talking about a bridge being destroyed. Yeah, cool physics. I mean, bridges come up a lot in films as well and they always seem to want to try and destroy them. 
we, we were planning this episode, um, Spider-Man, the newest film was mentioned. And uh, there was that, a big battle on Tower Bridge. Mysterio was doing something with his drones and there were lots of explosions. But I, I don't remember the bridge actually being destroyed in that one. Am I remembering that correctly? Yes, I think it was a very resilient bridge, isn't it? <laughs> While talking about the Tower Bridge, I would need to say a bit about its engineering. It's a bit different to what I was explaining about the two pin. If you imagine the middle span of the Tower Bridge when it's open, we call that a cantilever. So each bit is a cantilever. So if you think of each half of the span as a balcony, that is a cantilever structure. So it would hold the forces on only one side and the whole load will transfer instead of like thinking of the packed viaduct and the two pins. So the the whole load will go to one end and the other half of the load will go to the other end. And that is a cantilever bridge. Ah, so when you say lever, I think of something that sort of goes up and down to let ships go through. That's what a lever means to me, but rest cantilever means it's sort of counterweighted. Yeah, it makes sense in a way. So aside from Tower Bridge not actually being destroyed, it's a really iconic image of, of London. Are there any other iconic bridges that stick out in your mind when you think of a city? Because I think that was part of Alex's interest in bridges. So I guess Alex has given one of hers. For me, it's probably the Golden Gate Bridge again, because it comes up in so many films and it, it often seems like it's been destroyed in those films. I um, mean, Rueda, you mentioned earthquakes and that's an earthquake zone, isn't it? Cause it's on a fault. Yeah. And there are lots of monsters that come out of the sea in films that seem to want to attack that bridge. <laughs> well, what can you tell me about the Golden Gate Bridge? Uh, as we kind of explaining the type of bridges, so it's a suspension bridge. That is a bit different to the other bridges because if you have seen the curved cables that are coming along and there's like tiny cables so the tiny cables will uh, carry the load from the dock of the bridge the beam to the suspenders what we call them the huge curved cables and these will transfer the load up to the tower which we transfer that to the foundation for the suspension of bridges, you'll have a huge span in the middle. If you think of the cantilever London Tower Bridge, it's a shorter span in the middle, so you didn't need the extra support to go longer. There you go, another type of bridge. Ah, so what's the engineering in that suspension bridge that allows it to have a bigger span than the Tower Bridge in London? Is it the fact it's not cantilever? Cantilever, if you prefer. You can pronounce it both ways. Well, if you think of the cantilever bridge and the point at the middle, it will like reach to a point, will, it will deflect more, right? And it won't be structurally stable. And that's where the suspender come in. So they will pinpoint the small cables all along that huge span. And these small cables will carry on the load to the suspender. Okay. And that is uh, one aspect to it. And the other aspect is the material that the small cables and the spender are made of. I see. You're talking to someone that simulates atoms in a past life during a PhD. So when you say small, you don't mean atoms small. <laughs> well, I, I mean structurally, uh, as like as a structure uh, kind of a small, not as tiny, tiny <laughs> bit small. So if you compare the small like cables to the suspender, they're small, aren't they? If you put them in that perspective. All relative, yeah. So are they like sort of like the, the small cables, like sort of as thick as your wrist, maybe? Any idea? Well, I think you have like cycled over that bridge. <laughs> yeah, I did, but I wasn't really looking at the cables when I was doing it. I think it would be like thicker. I don't know really, but it would be smaller than the suspender, which will be huge. Okay. So yeah, you mentioned I've been to the US. I have traveled quite a bit around America. And when I was in New York, I heard about a nature bridge there that sounded pretty cool because um, well, Manhattan's really built up. I mean, yeah, you've got Central Park, but apart from that, it's all just concrete canyons of buildings you mean a concrete jungle no concrete jungle of what dreams are made of <laughs> I don't. it's honestly it is more like canyons than jungle it honestly is that was a <laughs> reference to alicia keys she's wrong <laughs> i know jungles and i know canyons it's definitely more of a canyon well alicia keys never wrong <laughs> yeah how can you deny alicia keys i see you saying i'm wrong yeah artistic license on the on descriptions eh? 
Yeah, fair enough. It's not a hard science describing a city. <laughs> but I thought the idea of having this nature bridge, so repurposing an old bridge that possibly isn't in use anymore into something new that could be useful was pretty cool. And uh, another member of the podcast team was telling me about one in Warrington as well, where they've designed this bridge that's got like plants and things growing on it. So it's a bit of a green space amidst a concrete thing. <laughs> <laughs> Concrete plateau or Warrington. You have a thing with concrete, Laura. <laughs> yeah, because it's interesting, but that's a different episode. <laughs> Speaking of sustainability and materials, if we think of how ancient civilization used different environmentally friendly construction materials, that's the first kind of materials. I'm trying to think what they would have started with. It would have had to have been rope and wood moving up to masonry, rocks. I know there are a lot of old masonry bridges in the Lake District, but I don't think I'm going far enough back thinking about those. I'll jump in and say clay bricks was the material that the Tillo Bridge in ancient Mesopotamia was made of, which is interesting because it's very <laughs> environmental friendly. Yeah, it's interesting. So a lot of the bridges in the lake district, there's a lot of mining around the lakes. So a lot of the bridges are made from local materials, which I guess is why they're constructed the way that they are. Lots of slate, I remember from my walks. I love that in terms of sustainability. Using local things that are readily available. Yeah. I guess that only works for certain locations, though. Yeah. Another member of the podcast was talking about how she would commute over a rope suspension bridge. It was the only way of getting from wherever she was to wherever she needed to go. And I, I can't imagine doing that. It was a very different country. It's very different construction materials. Yeah, I think that's really different to imagine going over a rope bridge, which is kind of something out of a movie every day on your way to school or to work. And that was your only way. Yeah, it reminds me of the scene from Indiana Jones, where he's having that battle on the bridge that he deliberately destroys to try and get free of people. And they're all sort of hanging off the side of this cliff. I can't imagine doing that as a commute, not Indiana Jones style, of course, but just sort of day to day walking across a bridge that hasn't deliberately been destroyed. But again, it's another bridge being destroyed. But what do you think also helps them last longer? First will be the engineering behind it. The other bit would be the material, which leads us to something Alex knows more about, which is the maintenance of bridges. Yeah, so I do a lot of work on bridge maintenance. This is where I saw all those lovely bridges in the Lake District. I went for a week and we did bridge inspections on raw iron bridges, masonry bridges, reinforced concrete bridges, keeping up that maintenance, checking if there are any kind of faults or defects and sorting them out ASAP. Haven't inspected a wooden rope bridge yet. Hopefully I will in the future though. I think there are many wooden rope bridges still in existence that are still used. I'm trying to think if I know any famous ones. They come from film quite a bit but I don't remember using any in real life. Mm -hmm. There's the Via Ferrata at Honister. I've gone across it, but it's three cables. So you're literally walking across this chasm with your feet on one cable and your hands either side is the, the railing. And that's it. You've got a, a safety harness. But unless you fall off, you don't need that harness. And I find that really weird that I walked across a canyon using just three ropes, even though they were made out of steel rather than uh, natural fibres. That's kind of... Um stomach dropping isn't it <laughs> <Just> <laughs> <laughs> I actually stopped to think about it yeah the most memorable rope swing bridge for me was the one in Shrek honestly like still gives me goosebumps now I just remember because I was saying about the symbolism of bridges and that really symbolized income and danger in the castle you just knew what was coming as soon as you saw that bridge did it have music to it as well where like he and Donkey were both running around being chased by the dragon <laughs> Yeah, and then at the end, I think, yeah, the bridge snaps and um, they fall and Shrek's holding on to Donkey by his tail and you're just like, oh my God, don't fall into the lava. I still remember it like it was yesterday. <laughs> yeah, in a sort of Indiana Jones parody. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was doing a bit of research into this and according to the Historic Bridge Foundation, bridges do seem to signify change in films and society in general. They not only represent the expansion of empires, but they're also associated with danger and death or evil. And then there's something about the psychology of the walkway or the road that crosses over empty space that has something in relation to dread and uncertainty. So I guess they're used quite well in films to present represent a particular theme that they're trying to get across. And I wonder if maybe that's why I'm sort of drawn to some of the historic ones, because they're in strange out of the way places. And you can imagine all these sort of historic cloak and dagger things going on in these kind of quiet hidden glens. 
that sounds like a good place to leave it there. We've uh, covered a lot about bridges. We've talked about, about why we love them, what, why they get destroyed and how to actually keep them standing. So I think we'll draw the conversation to a close, but maybe let's say science can build a bridge and we'll bridge this gap into Alex's podcast, which we might be uh, having a crossover into. So Alex, please can you tell us a little bit about embracing diversity? Yes, so this is a collaboration. We're bridging both of the podcasts together. My podcast is called Embracing Diversity, Diversity Diaries. And the aim is to let everybody know how to be an ally for the different diversities because kind of reflecting on diversity, women in engineering, that's kind of the only real diversity I have within the industry. And I don't think there's enough out there to let people know how to become allies and really draw awareness to different diversities we can find, celebrate the differences and just celebrate how unique and diverse our industry is in engineering. And I really want to expand this out into construction and STEM subjects and just keep it growing and growing. Great. Thanks, Alex. So if you enjoyed this, please continue the conversation. Maybe send us some information about your favourite bridge packs or how bridges were made on Twitter. The views expressed in this podcast belong entirely to the person that said them. They do not represent any industry or organisation. If you enjoyed listening to these views, it would really help us out if you could rate us, leave a review and tell a friend. This podcast was sponsored by no one, but if you're interested in funding us to continue to have frank discussions about science and engineering, please get in touch.